Hi, Ashley Aarons here, Client Services Director with the Rocky Mountain Victim Law Center. Thank you for joining us for our fifth and final video on the VRA and your rights. The biggest thing we wanted to talk about in this video is your right to be heard. Um, I'm jumping right in because this is an exciting right that many people have questions about. So there are a number of different places and times in a case where you might have the right to be heard. That can include things like a modification to a bond. It can include things like um, a subpoenaing of your records, private, medical, mental health, any sort of private record, um, as well as the most common one we get questions about, which is the victim impact statement. So walking through that right to be heard is still sitting on that foundation of fairness, dignity, and respect. So one of the biggest parts around the right to be heard is first you're notified that this thing has come up or that you're going to have the right to be heard. So for an individual who might have a, a record subpoenaed, you should get notification which should allow you to have time to prepare a statement as to why you'd like those records to be entered or not. For many of the folks that we work with, privacy is such a vitally important part of the plan that they have for this case. You know, no one asks to be a victim. No one is responsible for their victimization. And so one of the biggest pieces that people struggle with is this invasion of privacy that can happen throughout a case where, you know, the DA's office or the defense are asking for things that otherwise wouldn't have come into the public eye. So during moments where a defense subpoena has come in and they're discussing potential records of yours that could come in, you have the right to be heard. For a victim impact statement, you should be notified that a critical stage is occurring, such as a plea disposition or sentencing hearing, so that you can prepare a statement in advance of that. Oftentimes, um, when things aren't working as well as they should, we hear that folks are told that they need to prepare a victim impact statement within 24 hours or less. That, for many folks, is clear, nearly impossible. <laughs> um, when we think about all the trauma that's wrapped into victimization of any kind, it's hard for folks to be able to get their thoughts together, to work, um, to create a coherent statement in such a short amount of time. So often, one of the biggest conversations we have with DAs is how can we slow this down? How can we give someone proper time to get their thoughts together so that they can stand up and share what they're feeling? So speaking of standing up and sharing what you're feeling, what ways are people often heard in court? So there are a number of different ways you could certainly go in and stand up at the podium, usually um, in front of the judge, but between the two desks that are the defense and the DA's office and make a statement yourself that you've written or that you're thinking of off the top of your head. You could prepare a letter in advance and turn that into the DA's office or directly to the clerk. Um, you can have someone speak for you. So if you have a written statement that perhaps you don't like public speaking or you know that it'll be too hard for you to get through this, um, you can have someone stand up on your behalf and read it, a family member, a friend, a victim advocate. Um, additionally, because we are a law office, we talk about the fact that you can have your attorney stand up and read whatever statement you want or paraphrase on behalf of the conversations that you've had prior with that person. Some other alternative means for providing impact statements or providing the opportunity to be heard are things like Skype or the phone. We know and suggest that you coordinate with your district attorney victim advocate way in advance if you know that that's going to be a problem. Oftentimes there's a very strict procedure that the court has to follow in order to make sure that phone access or Skype access is available for somebody. You really want to start that ball rolling as early as possible. A couple tips that we often have around victim impact statements, um, whether that's preparing it or um, giving it in court, is first and foremost, make sure you're speaking to the judge. Oftentimes many of the survivors we're working with want to speak to the defendant who's caused the harm. Um, unfortunately, that's not the way that our court system is set up. You can't speak directly to the defendant. Although some ways around that that we've often utilized in our office is to say things like, judge, if I were to speak to the defendant, this is what I want to say. And then listing off what you'd like to say. Certainly don't include any profanity. Try to keep your thoughts as logical as possible. Sometimes it's helpful to have a person who's not as familiar with your case um, or who's not as emotionally invested in your case read through what you've written to see if a regular lay person like a judge um, who maybe doesn't have all the facts of your case can understand logically the way that your victim impact statement is flowing. And then last but not least, don't be afraid to be emotional. So for many people, they choose not to participate in the victim impact statement process um, because they're worried about crying or not getting through um, what they need to say. It's okay to cry. It's okay to get upset and angry. Certainly you can't be explosive and you probably won't have um, tons of time. If you do need to take a break, that's totally appropriate. But we absolutely wanna make sure that you know that 
you know, crying or getting upset or struggling to get through something so important is one, not uncommon, but also shouldn't preclude you from giving that statement. There are a lot of opportunities, I think, um, for the victim impact statement or any sort of um, survivor statement to make a difference in the case. I've certainly seen that happen in my practice, and we get that question a lot. How important is this? Um, how much of a difference will it make? And while we can't ever guarantee that you will change the perspective of the DA or that the defendant is going to hear what you've said and change their mind or behavior, it's certainly an opportunity to be heard in a way that's unique to the the sentencing process or to the plea disposition process in a way that you wouldn't, for example, be heard in a trial. If you have any questions about victim impact statements, subpoenas, privacy, um, bond modifications, please don't hesitate to reach out to our office. As I've mentioned through all of the videos about the VRA, we are certainly here for consultation and connection to ensure that you get as much information you, as you need to make well-informed decisions about how you want to move forward with your case, how you want to enforce or enact or act on your rights, um, and certainly so that you can be treated with fairness, dignity, and respect throughout the tenancy of a criminal case. Again, I'm Ashley Ahrens. You can look forward to our next set of videos coming in the next few weeks, and we appreciate you sticking with us and joining us for these five videos to know your rights about the Victim Rights Act.